our thing is that innovation equals integration. We want you to have a complete solution, and we'd like to provide a, part, a, a good portion of that solution as well. We have a product called Z-Ray, which interfaces between ball grid array packages and circuit boards. It becomes quite nice in situations where you're in a test environment. You don't want to reflow the solder balls down to the board. This is a pressure fit and then can be cycled many times and give you uh, basically a, an interchangeable system. And it's a nice way to interconnect. Other options are we have full surface, surface mount technology. We do wire bonding, flip chip, and um, other interconnects as well. And we do them both at a monolithic and a wafer level uh, system, and we do multiple chips as well. Here's some examples directly towards um, MEMS and sensors and also biomedical. The first one is a microfluidic device for DNA sequencing. You may have seen this uh, time and again. Uh, we have inlets and outlets and then the active silicon to do the uh, sequencing events. Next you see a MEMS assembly with basically um, a three-dimensional layout of wires, gold wires for bond wires. Thirdly, uh, we deal with standard ball grid array technology. They're the acronym, and we love acronyms because we're engineers. Uh, ball grid array is BGA. And then finally, stack die. This is quite impressive because otherwise stack die are not done outside of, uh, of memory technology. In this case, this is a mixed technology, heterogeneous, and it's integrated. So the current term is called heterogeneous integration and we've done this over the past five years. What you see again is a little bit more of a close-up on those stacked die packages. Um, no job is too big for us. We take the uh, impossible things and, and really work hard on that. Um, our customers know that too. High density flip chip, wire bonding, and then high density flip chip in a multi-chip module. That last instance, that's a um, uh, semiconductor wafer inspection system. It has 44 flip chip. Um, it's about the size of a good postcard um, and can actually, it's analogous to being able to find a needle in the haystack from a satellite and uh, within about 10 seconds. So the technology, the acquisition is quite huge. Our customers actually will bring in test equipment and will then um, uh, with a T1 or, or a greater speed, they'll transmit it back for data analysis as well. Now, let's change gears into medical and biomedical. These are some quotes from some people I really respect and uh, enjoy having company with because uh, they're some of the trend-seeking uh, trend and trend-setting um, groups. Um, they are the leaders in many instances. The first one is from Dr. Ravi Shinoy at uh, Qualcomm, Qualcomm Life is pushing forward on having the next killer app, not in cell phones, but in medical device technology. Next quote from PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, really focusing on companies, high-tech companies, sort of broadening what they're good at. We can see it in not just medical and biomedical, but we can see it also in aut autonomous vehicles making use of the consumer electronics, such as cell phones, and bringing those into applications. Uh, autonomous vehicles will have approximately 10 um, smart cameras on them. Uh, right now, the number is about four to eight, but there will be 10. They are completely different cameras than your cell phone. They have to see in the dark almost. It's a low uh, luminescence, uh, setting and environment, so they have to be able to function under those conditions. They don't need tens of megabytes of pixels. The same thing is true with endoscopes. Um, we have designed into an endoscope out of Japan our Firefly product, which then takes the data, and the data streams are huge, but they can actually take an endoscope, and it's an 8K endoscope versus what we have available in the consumer industry is about a 4K. Um, resolution and uh, not even take the endoscope too close and project it nicely on a 60 inch screen so they can do a much better job at resolution of key features uh, during the endoscopy uh, procedure. 
And then finally, um, sort of the lurking giant is Google's Verily. Um, Verily was called uh, Google Life Sciences prior to this. Uh, they're an interesting company to work with, uh, lots of challenges. In this case, just trying to miniaturize um, uh, electronics and the technologies in the biomedical space. So as Brian Otis has pointed out, it's really taking technology and life sciences and bringing them together. So I think you'll see some very exciting uh, new features in wearables that will be uh, pretty amazing and within the last few years. This is an example of us doing wire bonding. This is a huge number of wire bonds. Again, we specialize in that. That's a standard packaging technology for us. It's not quite as advanced as um, doing things at the wafer level or chip level. Now, I'm told by our legal that I have to warn you that what you're about to see next may disturb you a little bit. And it usually disturbs engineers more than the average citizen because we're kind of weird. Uh, <laughs> but it's a biomedical device. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, it's an implantable, it's a MEM sensor, it's a pressure sensor. It's now, uh, basically this, we produce this for our customer, um, excuse me, it's got a transition, but it is a um, very hard to implement a MEMS device for sensing blood pressure, so to look for strokes. Right now it's implanted in a, a bovine or cow or pig and uh, it's worked out quite well for them. So we look at difficult situations, particularly flip chip at a very, very small level and uh, implement it successfully. Now the next slide I uh, sort of borrowed from um, uh, Cambridge consultants, but I think it really enhances what we have today to do packaging in biomedical areas. Um, first is to identify a value proposition. Is it really worth it? Can we price it cost effectively? Um, how much work is it to deal with the FDA and um, get the most successful product and uh, the most viable product? Next is to design the experience uh, from a user standpoint, from a physician standpoint, and also with the hospital or clinic that it's being done in. And then finally develop the technology. And uh, uh, Dr. Kamat, the author of this particular one, and, and this is a really nice read through, it's short, but it's that long-term strategy. It has to be strong because there's a lot of competition in the room. It has to have a solution roadmap, so it's not trial and error, it has a plan. Some roadmap that you have to uh, have many paths, but you're going along to the same goal. Next is to make platform decisions or embark on the design and development and revisit and update uh, basically as much of that roadmap that you can. I have a roadmap as well, and I'll show it to you uh, uh, shortly. There are concepts and actual initiatives. This one's called the Connected Patient. And by 2040, we're hoping to have both the device technology and the equipment technology uh, to support the ongoing connected health situation. And this is also from IHS, which is a marketing research firm, but I put a lot of credibility in this. I do mention companies that are actively pursuing both the hardware solutions and the personal solutions to device solutions. Um, you'll see that many of these companies have reinvented themselves or redefined themselves, particularly in the device space because it's a new uh, space for many companies. Apple's on there, um, IBM's uh, Watson Health, and uh, Google Life, or Google Verily, and Qualcomm Live. So pay attention to these companies. They may be competitors, but the more you know them, the better you will be able to compete as well. Here's just a short list on um, devices that are in development or were in development in 2016. It gives you a feel for the composition or demographics of, of the devices that are being developed today. There's also the segmentation of what's a medical therapy and what's a medical instrument or equipment. And I've highlighted some of the main ones. We're involved in most of these uh, market sectors uh, at SAMTAC. Uh, from a packaging level, from an interconnect level for cabling and, 
and connectors, and also from an optics standpoint, electro-optics. So we have sensors that um, really help uh, advance the speed of, of the um, data transfer. Unfortunately, the light green doesn't cascade very well, but we're heavily into system and package. Uh, if you stop by our booth, it's uh, booth 961. Um, we have a Firefly product that uh, will take high-speed data to the new level. But this is what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and has a lot of uh, differentiation. Our ideal goal is to take the packaging out of the equation, have minimal packaging as much as possible. And the only way you can do that is at the wafer level. Uh, we also have a glass core technology of which I'll talk about too. Our specialty is miniaturization. If you're starting out with a very large generational thing on a circuit board and you'd like to shrink it, we've got quite a few answers. And we'd be more than happy to discuss that with you. We had a IoT device. Normally it would be on the order of an inch by three or four inches. We were able to scale it down with glass. It had three chips on it, Bluetooth low energy, a microcontroller, and a Kodak chip for video a codec chip, um, we were able to shrink that to a fourth of the size using our glass core technology, and I'll explain more about it. But miniaturization, particularly in the uh, medical industry, will sort of revolutionize everything. You're putting a lot of function in a much smaller footprint, and there are strategies within that. And then there's the remaining um, um, reasons for doing system in a package. What we used to call multi-chip modules. Now, I said we're an interconnect company. Samtech enjoys being in this position because we understand the infrastructure that exists within the electronics industry and in various applications. At the upper end, it's the wafers, the chips, the MEMS devices that have very small interconnects on the order of less than 10 microns of feature size. As we go down this stream, we tend to add more complexity, a lot of interconnect, and we fan out all the interconnects. What we found to be most successful is to integrate as small of a feature as possible so that the cost is now diminished for implementing a very small feature. So the better manufacturability is also by dealing with things while they're small and our scales are pretty tremendous here. Oops. Real quickly, um, we talk about integration. One of those is packaging. Uh, we can start adding more and more chips to a single substrate or what we call an interposer now today. We have chosen to do both organic or printed circuit board material, but also glass. Glass is a, uh, a material and it doesn't have, I'll say glass is glass, but there's fusilica, quartz, sapphire, zirconia, and they play into this situation. But depending on the application, particularly for biomedical, we need biocompatible materials as well. But now you can actually start building up some complexity to your design. And we also have 3D packaging, where now chips are stacked on top of each other, whether they be MEMS, CMOS, and other types of chip technologies. Here's my roadmap. The company has said, Steve, we need to march forward. We need some guidance. It's a little bit higher level so that you can understand where we've been and where we're going. We start out at the bottom with um, sensor packaging as we know it from the 1980s. Um, the whole idea there was to prove out and over 80%, maybe even 90% are the conventional accelerometer, which we use in airbag sensors gyroscopes where we use for vehicle stabilization and um, at a loss here, but I think the other one is pressure sensors. So from that, and of course in the 1980s, most of that was automotive. It has now been perfected. The resolution has been done quite well to use those also in the medical field. So we actually have accelerometers and gyros. In this case, in a smartwatch, very small form factor. Pressure sensors will continue to be used in, in uh, blood analysis and such. And then we start to integrate more and more as we go up this trajectory. 
Conventionally, we've had multi-chip modules and system and package. And then we start to diversify. And Samtech has chosen to do two areas of diversification. One of those is the orange. Again, the orange is our favorite color at Samtech, except for Mark. Mark, Mark Boone is our uh, uh, medical industry uh, specialist and sales and uh, really works hard to um, uh, push forward on all of these products. So we label them MEMS and sensors. And as we go up those circles in orange, we tend to get more and more of, a, of a, an application specific, such as microfluidics, which is very important for medical and biomedical. It's also important for electronics cooling. So our uh, effort is to put in electronics cooling by uh, putting fluid through a substrate, and glass is the perfect instance, where we can pull heat out of all the metal and the power chips and uh, eject it from the substrate. Otherwise, you're stuck with the um, metal lid, um, thermal interface material, and heat sink, and now becomes a much larger structure. Again, this is the miniaturization part. Do it in situ. Take the heat out of the substrate and eject it into the system. We have an upper branch there, which is our optics and photonics. Um, in that case, we've used standard Vixel, uh, vertical, um, vertical cavity surface emitting lasers, uh, approximately 800 nanometers, 850 nanometers. We'll start to increase that and start to go into a silicon photonics. Silicon photonics will take a, an extreme amount of data, particularly when you're doing data analysis on DNA, for sure. And as you see, we had to make some decisions along the way to really go from a 2D world in those three white um, bubbles there. Let's see. Here we go. So these three have focused towards um, uh, a planar technology. As we go into these areas, we're now talking about a 2.5D and a 3D solution. And that's important when we start mixing chips. 